All right. All right, moving down the leg. Uh, now we have tibia shaft fractures. <clears throat> uh, the most common long bone fracture, uh, over almost half, half a million yearly. Uh, one quarter of them are open. Uh, again, bimodal uh, distribution. Uh, the low energy injuries, typically torsional. Uh, the simple patterns, uh, often the tibia and fibula fracture at different levels. A higher end injury, you can have increased incidence in neurovascular uh, compromise as well as open fractures. You have the, high, the heightened suspicion for compartment syndrome. Uh, once again, there's descriptive classifications uh, as well as the AO. Uh, similar, similar to other AO classifications, you have the A, which is simple, B, uh, and C, which is common rooted. Uh, on evaluation, you want to do full AP lateral views. You want to include the joint above and below. Uh, for anything, anytime you think there could be an articular involvement, you want to consider a CT scan. Uh, this is a study at a JOT. They, they looked at all distal tibia, one-third tibia shaft fractures. They found that 43% of them, these are spiral distal tibia fractures, had 43% uh, of them had articular injuries, and less than half of them were actually identified on plain films by uh, the traumatologists in the study. So basically, the, their take home was uh, if it's a spiral fraction, you suspect there's an intraarticular extension, CAT scan, it's probably not a bad idea before you slam a nail down. Uh, so on an evaluation, uh, almost a third of them will have additional injuries, uh, most commonly femur fractures, ligamentous injuries, or foot and ankle injuries. Uh, Non-operative uh, management uh, is a consideration. <clears throat> The criteria include less than a centimeter shortening, uh, minimal angulation, uh, non-ambulatory patients or post-surgical candidates. Uh, treatment would be long leg cast, non-weight bearing, then you convert them to functional brace uh, about four to six weeks out, and then you can transition to boot once you see healing. Sarmiento uh, did a study, you know, he was, he was big on non-operative managing these. He, uh, he had over 600 uh, diaphyseal tibia fractures. Once again, he had a pretty big core that was lost to follow up, but he found that 98.5% of them healed, and most of them healed without significant angulation. Uh, indications to fix these unacceptable alignment, close treatment, uh, severe soft tissue injury, uh, open fractures, high energy injuries, uh, ipsilateral uh, low extremity injury, or polytraumas, or morbidly obese patients not amenable to casting and bracing. <clears throat> so the options include uh, you can nail it, you can plate it, or uh, X-fix. <clears throat> uh, this is a JOT study in 2017. They compared uh, IM nail versus uh, non-operative management. They found that IM nail had clinical, uh, clinically improved outcomes at three months, faster time to union. At six months, there was no significant difference. One, uh, this was... This is an older study, but basically they looked at uh, unstable tibia shaft fractures. So these were more displaced fractures than the prior study. Uh, they found that the IM nail had a significantly lower rate to uh, non-union, malunion, shortening, which makes sense. An unstable fracture is not going to be very amenable to close management. Uh, so in terms of intramedular nailing, you have multiple options. There's the infra patellar, which is kind of classical uh, approach, uh, inferior border of the patella uh, in line with the tendon. You can do a tendon split versus parapetellar. Uh, Semi-extended uh, position developed by Tornetta, uh, or first written about by Tornetta uh, in 1996. It was basically a, a small medial arthrotomy. Uh, and then Cole, uh, in 2006, published about the superpatellar approach using a midline quad insertion site, which I do for uh, most of my tibia nails at this point. Uh, the superpatellar uh, incision is just superior to the pole patella in line with the quad tendon. Uh, one of the concerns, obviously, with the, putting the nail behind the patella, uh, the patella is you're going to cause cartilage injury. Uh, they did a cadaver study uh, looking at the contact pressures. And they found that uh, the amount of pressure on the chondrocytes was less than would cause ap apoptosis. Um, this is comparing super patella versus super patella nailing. Um, th they actually looked at uh, post-op post arthroscopy and MRIs. Uh, they, they found that only three patients had change in the patellofemoral articular cartilage post-nailing, and none of them had knee pain. 
there was no change in knee pain, range of motion, disability, 12, 12 months. So basically their, you know, conclusion was patellar is just as safe as infrapatellar in terms of damage to the intraarticular structures. <clears throat> this, this is a study that came out a couple years ago in JOT. Uh, it was retrospective, but it was the largest series to date. Um, they, they compared, once again, su suprapatellar versus infrapatellar nailing. Uh, they found that the infrapatellar nails had higher uh, post-op uh, malunion rates in distal third fractures, uh, which makes sense uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're nailing these, these fractures on, you know, doing infrapatellar nailing, you have to have the triangle. Um, you, you have an assistant holding the, trying to hold the fracture reduced uh, while you're reaming and placing the nail. It's difficult to get x-rays. Uh, as opposed to the super patellar nail, you're, you're on a bone foam, the leg is flat. It's much easier just to hold, you know, gentle traction, keep everything aligned uh, during the, the nailing process. Uh, so the techniques, there's multiple kind of tools you can use to get the reduction and hold it. You can use percutaneous clamps, uh, blocking screws. These are, as this image shows, uh, correcting this deformity. You place them on the, on the concave side of the deformity, forcing the nail over and preventing the deformity. Uh, you can use a distractor or an X-fix, and then unicortical plates are, are an option, particularly in open fractures when you're staring at the bone anyway. Uh, knee pain does occur. Uh, it's depending on which study you're reading, it's anywhere from 10 to 80 uh, percent. There's, no there's no difference in terms of through the, the tendon or lateral to the pet, uh, tendon, at least that's never been shown. Uh, Tornetta uh, found that, which makes sense as the fracture heals, the knee pain decreases. Uh, after the fracture is healed, uh, it's kind of all bets are off. If you still have knee pain, you, you might have it forever. Uh, Court Brown published a study in 96 where they found the removal of the nail actually resolved uh, the knee pain in 27% and 69% and improved, which is you know, pretty high numbers. <clears throat> so other option is perk lock plating. Uh, these are for, um, as you can guess, you know, close to the joint above or uh, below the mid shaft. Uh, comparison showed uh, this is a prospective randomized controlled study at a JOT. They found no difference in union rate or secondary survey surgery. Um, as you can guess, the nail had a slightly higher uh, malunion rate. Another JOT study, this was retrospective, compared uh, nailing versus putting a proximal tibia fractures. Uh, they found that the lock plating had uh, lower incidence of malunion, again. No, no difference in union rate. However, you can have symptomatic hardware. There's, there's been, since, since those two studies, there's been a lot of reviews, and basically, uh, it's kind of dealer's choice. Um, we, we really need more, more studies showing the new, the new plates to, to make a firm conclusion about which one is ideal for very distal or very proximal fractures. <clears throat> uh, indications for X-Fix. Same as, you know, most X-fixes, if it's an open fracture, high energy, you're worried about the soft tissues, uh, damage control orthopedics, complications, pin tract infections, particularly if you're leaving these pins in for an extended period of time, delayed union, non-union, cases where you treat it definitively in the X-fix. Uh, complications, compartment syndrome, non-union infection. Uh, incidence of compartment syndrome is pretty wide uh, in terms of different studies, 1 to 10%. Uh, mid shaft has a higher incidence, which makes sense. Uh, that's where the bulk of the muscle tissue is. Uh, one, one kind of caveat is a lot of athletes will get compartment syndrome after tibia shaft uh, fracture is sustained during competition. You have to just be cognizant of that. Uh, it's not always just like a motorcycle or car accident. Uh, risk factors for non union include tobacco use, diabetes, segmental bone loss, open fractures, infection. Uh, the sprint study, uh, this was where they actually kind of retrospectively looked back at patients who had intervention for non-union, and they found that delaying uh, six months, uh, if you waited more than six months, you significantly decreased the need for an intervention. Uh, sometimes it's hard to kind of wait that long in, in some of these patients. Uh, so in terms of options for a non-union, if it's a axiostable fracture, you can do dynamization. Uh, reamed exchange nailing uh, is very effective if there's no evidence of infection. Posterior bone grafting, uh, it's been shown to be very safe and effective for uh, bone defects uh, with a very low complication rate. 
infections. Uh, if you have an infection and a fracture that is not, com that is not healed, uh, your options you know, are pretty limited. You, you kind of have to wash it out, hit them with antibiotics, and then get the, hopefully the fracture will heal. Uh, this is a study on JBJS. They found that just uh, you know, washing it out, keeping the hardware antibiotics, 71% of the, pa the patients went on to uh, union. Um, the chronic infection risk was highest in open fractures, smokers, and initial pseudomonas infection. Just a couple cases. This was a 14-year-old high school soccer player. Uh, he was casted, converted to a brace. This was three months. He was weight-bearing at this point. Uh, and then at six months, he had fully healed. Uh, this is a 54-year-old in a motorcycle accident. As you can see, there's a distal third uh, fracture. Uh, on the lateral uh, ankle radiograph, it's really hard to see. Uh, but, you know, based on that study out of JOT, you know, it was recommended to get a CT, which I did. It showed a posterior malfracture, which is clearly visible. I uh, just secured that with a single screw prior to, you know, reaming and sending the nail down. Uh, this case actually required a blocking screw as well. post-op x-rays, and I think it was about six months fully healed. <clears throat> this is another patient I actually just recently saw in the office uh, this week and kind of threw it on the, the slideshow. Um, this was a motorcycle accident, uh, grade 3B uh, open tibia shaft fracture, which is obviously segmental. Uh, she underwent initial X-fix debridement uh, and then I am nailing with plating of the fibula uh, once plastics was able to get closure. They actually did a, they were able to do a rotational uh, kind of fasciocutaneous flap uh, to cover that, that defect. Um, this is also kind of highlighting one of Stryker's new implants, the alpha nail. Uh, the fracture is fairly distal, uh, but they do have this locking, these locking screw options down here. So I took advantage of one of the first times I used this nail, but they actually lock into the plate and create a fixed angle device down there, uh, which was really helpful in this particular fracture because it extended really all the way down to here. Um, and this is her at her six month follow up. She pretty much healed and you know soft tissues look great. So that was a that was a win. Thanks. <clears throat>